Hello everyone. My name is John Vickers. Uh, I'm from STEMA Imaging and today we're going to be talking about machine learning. So the the real point of this talk is that it's going to be a primer. It's going to be uh, where you should start from. It's going to give you enough information that you can uh, make your first steps, have the first attempts and then start to learn. That's where we're going from. Um, I think the first thing to say is that most of the time you'll hear me talk about machine learning rather than deep learning, but uh, but deep learning is the the well-known phrase. Um, deep learning as a phrase came around about 2000 in academic papers when it was really talking about deep inference and deep inference got simplified to deep learning. <clears throat> Um, around 2012, it became a lot more popular with um, with Google and Facebook, um, and and it sort of came into the public uh, knowledge around that time. And since then, it's been very well received. Um, we've gone from uh, the market generally not wanting anything to do with it, you know, if if you don't know how something works, we won't use it, uh, to the complete opposite. People coming and asking for deep learning. Um, when people talk about deep learning, they're always talking about neural networks. Um, and neural networks are just one type of learning tool. That's why I talk about uh, machine learning rather than deep learning. So neural networks or artificial neural networks, because we're, we're not talking about brains, can be applied to many different applications. But in our case, we're interested in images. And when you're talking about images, they're always going to be convolutional neural networks. So convolutions are um, <clears throat> they're the, the ways that you apply filters to an image generally. So we're talking about edge filters, uh, corner filters, uh, even texture filters, where you're going to pull out some of those image primitives. And this image is designed to show here you're getting a response from something in the image. So neural networks, uh, there's an input layer, which might be your convolutions. There's an output layer, which is somehow your response. And in the middle, you've got your hidden layers and they can have a certain height, a certain width, um, <clears throat> a number of, of neurons or, or logic units. But notice more than anything else how interconnected it is. There are so many connections. Everything is interconnect interconnected in this, uh, this diagram. Um, this is what makes neural networks um, quite so flexible and it's the the way that these interconnections work that is how you train them. So really it's the you're putting emphasis or de-emphasis on the connections. Do you need to know this? Well not really but it's a bit of background. So what about in practice? Um, the training for, of a neural network is what makes it respond how we want it to respond. So what we're really doing is teaching it by examples. It's, it's learning by example. We're showing it what we want and giving it the, the input and then giving it an, an output that we want it to, uh, to have. <clears throat> In the case of the, uh, the image on the right there, we know what a car is. You know, a car has four wheels, it has doors, it has windows, it has a roof. The trouble is, if you look at an image of a car, do you see four wheels? No. Do you see always four doors? No. So you need to be a little more flexible. The rules have already started to break down there. So trying to parameterize, trying to set the rules is already not working with cars. And it's not just cars we're talking about. It could be anything It could be variable targets. So it could be something which genuinely changes. So in the case of, of cars, you can see there are various different shapes. It could be multiple targets. So if we if we stick with vehicles, maybe we're talking about cars and motorbikes. You know, these things are significantly different, but we could put them into one class of vehicle. Or maybe it's complex targets, something which it's just difficult to find the rules, the parameters that, that define it nicely. And if we generalize that a bit more, what we're talking about is any target where it's difficult to specify it. So maybe 
organic gets mentioned a lot because there there's a sort of variation a continuous variation of um, organic materials so we might be talking about vegetables but away from organic you've also got the the appearance can change based on the illumination so outdoor applications where the illumination is uncontrolled is also a good opportunity for um, machine learning also if we're outside maybe we don't have a controlled viewpoint the perspective can change and then finally you've got the the normal industrial applications but where the target might be somehow undefined so we're talking about looking for a defect where we don't know what the defect will look like we're looking for a scratch a mark a dent these things are, are very difficult to define and what about if we're not talking about neural networks well really it's the same case you know we're still looking at classifying or detecting variable targets and we're going to train them by um, labeling images and this this labeling is straightforward but it's it's how we get the human knowledge into the tool so uh, this is Halcon um, and what we're doing is drawing a rectangle around the target and saying what kind of class it is so in this case the the yellow rectangles are almonds the red rectangles are cashews this one's CVB we're using the the polymargo tool and here we're looking at coins you draw a rectangle you say what kind of coin it is <coughs> so organic applications we always talk about organic applications because really they're almost impossible to do any other way but they're not the only way but here are some examples food so in this case we're looking at uh, sandwich fillings think about how variable they are meat um, we've seen a, quite a few like this one uh, in this case we're looking at cuts of chicken drumsticks thighs or wings uh, it could also be counting the number in the tray um, and here roses so with roses if you look at the roses across the the top there they're quite nicely circular they're kind of typical yellow blooms but look at the ones below these are the same type of rose but they look much greener the um, the perspective is different they're much more closed and yet we want to class them classify them in the same way we still want them to be called moonwalk so what about a non organic application uh, well this is a real application um, what we're looking at here is um, an aluminium foil tray we're looking down into it uh, you can see a bit of a reflection of the light and you can see some dark blobs you can see five blobs on the image there and a couple of them are in in nice homogeneous areas right in the center and near the top um, the other three are quite close to edges either a bright edge or a dark edge and this is um, what initially looks like quite an easy application surely you just do a threshold and a blob but it's this these high contrast areas give us the problem the, the amount of changing contrast we see means that even local um, dynamic thresholds aren't able to pick out all of these blobs from the background but if we change that from trying to set rules threshold and then blob into a classification problem and actually train these these dark marks we turn it from a, a parameterization problem into a classification problem and what we found here is first of all we got to a solution faster it took less development we got to a successful solution and it was robust it was really dealing with these across the top where they weren't really contiguous dark blobs they were more like dusty stains so how do we train how do we get the knowledge into the tool well this is um, fairly similar across any of the learning tools set up the project you're going to have some initial parameters where you're probably saying what type of image is it color or mono um, maybe the scale of of the target that you're looking at as well um, and you add an image you label one or more classes so that's what we saw with the with the nuts some of the coins and you repeat 
So you label all the classes, you label a few images until you have a, a few samples of each class. And then take some initial training parameters, do some training, test the training. So you have some test images, we assume, and you repeat. So you improve your training. And then when you've got as far as you can with the training, repeat, repeat the whole process. So here we're going to add more images, add more classes, and eventually we reach an acceptable classifier. So here's how it looks. We're setting up some initial parameters here. So this kind of scale is what we're looking at. And then we open an image and we start adding, start labeling images. So we're, we've added a five pence and a pound class here. And we, we're gonna add all of the ones in the image here and then open a new image, add some more samples, any new classes that we have. And we're not doing many at this stage. We're just trying to get a feeling for, are we going in the right direction? Right, that was training. Training was over in a, a second or so there. And we start looking at the results. Now the results there said that we had two misclassifications. And then what we're looking at the end here, this, uh, this heat map is how high a classification quality we've got. So if you think about any search tool, you get some kind of a quality measure back. Um, same here. So if you look at the, the top four coins, there's a, a hot spot on the center of each of the coins. So that's at least showing we've got a high result, a high number, high quality, um, whether it's right or not. The bottom two don't. And these were the two that we got wrong. So this is already telling us that we're not getting a strong response for these two coins. These are the 20 cent coins at the bottom. This tells us we need to train more. You know, somehow we're not picking out these 20 cent coins. And the first thing you can do is uh, add more samples. So what can you achieve with, with uh, machine learning? Well, cats and dogs, the, the uh, Facebook problem. But more generally, machine learning is used for, for classification, type one versus type two. Which product am I looking at? Um, is this good or bad? But search is also a type of classification. You know, it's, it's really classification with um, localization added as well. And if you combine search and classification, um, you could make a, an OCR tool. So search for all the characters and then on each result, classify the character into what it is. So you created an OCR tool. Um, but compared to a classical OCR tool, this is machine learning. So we can deal with variability. And variability might mean real variability, like the uh, handwritten characters on the right, or it might mean the appearance varies. It might mean we're looking at stamped characters on metal and we can't control all of the, uh, um, the reflections that come back or we're on a noisy background. So all of these things can, um, can make a more robust uh, OCR tool. And so far, everything we've looked at has said that our outcomes are going to be strings, they're class names. Um, why not numbers? Why not do measurements? Well, machine learning isn't very good at, at measuring. It's much better at generalizing. But there are some things you can do. Now, this is a, a C1, but consider um, you're looking at something with a flat surface and uh, nicely defined corners. So I've, I'm going to say a, uh, a palette as an example. Now, one of the things you could say about that is we want to know the perspective we're looking at in order to, let's say, do a palletization or depalletization um, robotic operation. Okay, what can we do? Well, if we look at a, an example we've done here, this is SD cards. So these are um, similar in some way because they they have a flat surface which makes the perspective easy um, they're flat and square so it's it's nicely defined corners and we put it on this tilt table here so you can see we're we're changing the uh, the angle we're making it tilt we're making it rotate and this is what it looks like in software So when we get a little way through here, I select one of the SD cards. There we go. Right, let's look at what we've got. So the green one is the selected one. 
Um, first of all, we can say number of objects found five. Good. Current frame rate. This is camera frame rate, 30 frames a second. Uh, processing time is 12 milliseconds, so we've got um, plenty of headroom there. Uh, and then we see 2D search results. So we've got an X and a Y result like any search tool. Um, we've got an angle, okay, um, and we've got a scale. So a scale compared to um, how it was trained. So in some way, scale is giving us the Z value, the distance value. So we've got an X, Y and a Z. Below that, we've got the 3D search results. Now these 3D search results are angles, they're tilts. So we've got a tilt in X, a tilt in Y and a tilt in Z. So what we've got out of that is a 3D um, six axis result, all out of a 2D camera. And we can see that running live. So what do we need to remember about machine learning? Well, it's more work than a traditional tool. You're going to be training multiple images. There's going to be um, multiple iterations. So this is going to take some time. It's going to take some human time. You can automate some of this stuff. If you already have labeled images, you could throw them into a, um, let's say, into one directory and you um, train on that directory as a certain class. Machine learning is a really good way of dealing with variation. Variation in the real target, variation in appearance. And if you're looking for features, it can be a nice way to pull them out of noisy backgrounds. And it learns what you tell it. Now this bit's important because it only knows what you've told it. So it needs to see all the variation that a production system is gonna see. And for classification purposes, if you're trying to classify good versus bad, the borderline cases are the most important. What this means is you want to say this is a borderline good point, this is a borderline bad case. And that's how the, the tool learns where the border really is. And beware of training bias. It's very easy to say, um, here are some nice images that I want to train and here are some nasty images that I want to train. You want to see the full variation you know, and just training from one batch if things change between batch really doesn't help. And it's quite useful to get the information from the people who know the products best. And quite often these are the guys on the production line. These are the guys that see the variation, they see the things that go wrong. These are the guys who are doing it manually now. And the final question, when people get quite excited about machine learning, they say, we can have continuous improvement. I would avoid that. It's possible, but all of those iterations were about getting a classifier that did what you wanted. So why would you then remove the supervision and leave it to chance? So I'd, I would, um, keep some control over the training there as well. And this is not so different to any other vision application. You get it to a good state, you prove it to the customer, and then you keep it in a fixed state. The difference here is that the emphasis is really on training the right images and then tweaking settings. You know, it's not just settings. And that's where we are today. Thank you very much.